Hello and welcome, I'm Bill and this is Intro to C. Today's video I'm going to be talking about the process of making a computer program. So the first thing before making any computer program, you've got to think, what is your problem? So what is the problem? And you've got to think, okay, what is this problem that I'm trying to solve? It could be figuring out how much tax I owe to the government. It could be um, what is the dark matter density within dwarf spheroid galaxies. It could be um, how much do I need to put into this cake. It could be, I mean, it could be any of these random things. It could be I might just want to make a game is the problem. How do I make this game? Um, you got to think about it. It's random things. I know I'm just spitting out random topics. But yes, that's what's the problem. So that's the first step. It could be even a simple problem. Just don't worry about that. It just it could be anything. So the next problem is, how do I solve this problem? And you've got to think to yourself, how do I solve this problem? Could I do it on pen and paper? If so, do you need a computer program for it? No. But you could do it on pen and paper, but it may take you a very, very long time to do. So you think, okay, a computer program will actually save me a lot of time. You could do it on something else. Um, you could, you mean, if you're making a cake, you just follow a recipe and then shove it, in, shove it in the oven. That's how you've solved that problem. But if it's something like a computer game, or you've got something tax environment that is simulating gravity or physics or anything that requires a lot of computer power, or it's solving codes or encrypting things, cryptography, loads of different things, you may need a computer program for this. So, okay, you've got to that step. You think, I need a computer program now. You think, hmm. What do I need to do now? Okay, you need to write the code. Now, this step is also another step, like for instance, what program language am I going to use? Am I going to use C? Am I going to use another language? Or am I going to use something else? So, C may not be the appropriate language for the job. You may find there's another language that expresses the problem in a better manner. Again, this is what you've got to decide. For the um, the problem C may be the best thing. I want good. I need high performance, so I need to be low down to the hardware, and I need all that. Yeah, C is the good thing. I'm on an embedded system. C is a good thing. But then if you're a web browser, no, you need to use JavaScript or and stuff like that. So you can kind of see what the problem is. It's like you need to find out what the language you need to use is and what its domain is in. So once you've got to that, you've wrote your code. Now there's depending on the language, there's two kind of paths or two branches you could go down. So there's the one on the left, and I'm going to say the one on the right, the red pill and the blue pill. Actually, let's do that in red and blue. Do it. Yeah. Red <laughs> and blue. Down here. Now, the red path is for compiled languages. And then the one on the blue path is for interpreted languages. Inter... Inter... In... Oops. Interpreted. If I can spell for compiled and then interpreted languages. So I'm just going to go black now. So a compiled language, like what C is, C is a compiled language, what you do is you translate this code into something that the operating system can understand, or even the computer can understand. So this is gets it gets compiled, or translated is another way you can say it, and also it gets linked as well as a, I do a proper understand then, and linked that's another step. Don't worry. I'll get. I'll explain that when we come to it. But pretty much, the compiler, this compiler, changes the code into something the operating system and something the computer can understand. And then what you do is you then run that code, if it compiled correctly. So I'm going to put another step in here. Is if it doesn't compile correctly, and I'm going to do this in green. If there was an error, like it did not compile, did not compile then you've got a syntax error in there. So this means you've got so there's something wrong with the actual code. There's something wrong in the code, like you've um, it won't compile. You've tried to do multiplication, but you haven't put the multiplication operator in there. Or you've tried to, or in C, you, haven't, you forgot a semicolon or something like that. And it's a syntax error. This is different to something called a semantic error, which I'll get onto a bit later after I've discussed all this. So if that is the case, if this doesn't, if that process didn't run, what you need to do is you need to go back to writing the code. Yeah? So let's go back. And then once you've done that, you then run the program. All hell, all hell 
praise the heavens, whatever. It runs. Good. And if you didn't get to Haztep, you, you ran the first time. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> um, yes, that's very rare that sometimes programs run the first time. So the next step, the other branch you could go down for interpreting languages. These include Python and Ruby, JavaScript, and Python and Java, kind of. Uh, Java is like a semi-compiled, it compiles down to bytecode, which is then interpreted by a virtual machine, so it's kind of both, but not. But anyway, interpreted languages are something that's interpreted. So you pass it to an interpreter. And in interpreter reads the code and in and then translates on the fly, in a sense, on the fly. So what I mean by this is, think of a compiled language as if I wrote a letter to my friend, friend in France, but he can only speak French. So I need to translate my my letter from English into French. So I do that all, write the letter in French, and then, then I send it off to him. So now we can read it. Then what he would do back is he'd write it in French, and then he'd translate it into English so I could read it. So you go, there's what you're doing, that's what you're compiling. So what you're doing is you're doing blocks at a time, and then you're just doing the whole thing, and then doing a translation. So that's what compiler does. It does it into thing. An interpreter is something else. So what it does is I might be speaking to him. So I say something to the interpreter, some words, like a sentence. The interpreter then goes, translates it to the French guy. And then he go, he translates it back and does it that way. So it's kind of interpreted in a sense. So the interpreted languages are usually slower than compiled languages. And that's because there's this extra step, this is extra program that has to actually interpret our code to understand what's going on. Sometimes this is useful, sometimes it's not. Depending on the problem, it can be. So another thing about interpreting languages, you can just change the code and then you can also the interpreter can just read it straight away usually sometimes. Maybe not, depends on the setup. And the compile code is, is once you've changed the code, you've got to recompile it every time. This doesn't isn't always a problem. You can also have, you can reduce this effect, and also you can set up programs which will actually read new compiled code as well. I won't explain how to do this in this series because this is an intro to C. This, that would be an advanced thing to do. Um, but yes, yeah, so once you've done that, this interpreter actually and it actually and it runs it at the same time. So there's another step in here. It will actually do the same thing again. Is if this thing happens, it did not. It says did it throw an error? Did did not interpret, it could not interpret what it was writing, you got another syntax error in there. So the code was wrong, so you need to go back to the writing the code stage. So this is kind of like the debugging stage in a sense, um, but you're just trying to fix code, so you need to get it right. So once you've got that, those two steps kind of come back together, and you do the same sort of like process to it. So you think, okay, did the program run as expected? So did did it run as expected? Run did it run or execute as expected? And if the answer is yes, like I say yes, uh, yeah, yeah, doing that color yes, then you're done. You got your program done, and or you may have to just repeat stuff if you want to stuff. But did it say no? And if the case is no, that means you've got bugs in your code. You so you now need to debug your code. Now, if you're a beginner and you you need programming or even computing in general, you may be asking yourself, why do they call it bugs? Why is there a bug in your code? Well, this actually goes back to um, about the 50s, and there was um, a computer scientist and computer programmer named Grace Hopper. Um, if you want to learn more about her, you can just go on to your favourite search engine of your choice. And she, they were at the time they used to run literally code, pass it through onto the computer on tape, literally like physical tape. And one day they had a problem, like the the program wasn't executing properly. They used it before and it wasn't running, so they had to look through the code and see what was wrong. And they found literally a moth stuck to the tape, and they lit so literally there was a bug in the code. So ever since then, they'd have to literally debug the code, so literally get rid of the bugs in the actual code, physical bugs, moths and flies and stuff, to make sure it was running as proper, proper ex running as expected. 
So that's where the debugging process comes from. Nowadays, the, you most likely won't ever get flies stuck in your code because it's on a computer, not actual physical tape. Um, so what you need to do is then you need to say this debugging process is you now need to go back and then I'll do this again with the green pen is you need to go back to write it, changing the code. So that's the whole point of that debugging step. Once you've got that correct, you go back, it's kind of a little flow diagram I'm making here in a sense. Once you've done your program, then there's one last, a few more steps you've got to do. And this is what the majority of your time does when you're in, like doing professional programming is you've got to maintain that code. You got That means you've got to extend the features, replace some of them, and just you got to do all the things. So you may be thinking, okay, I've made this piece of code to do um, handle this uh, PayPal or something. I'm making this up, by the way. And you think, okay, now I need to handle another service that handles money. You now to, need to extend it. You may find out that actually this code was only specific to PayPal, so you need to write some more, replace it, or make it more general. So you can see where the problem rises from. It becomes quite... It, that's the job you're doing. So you keep doing ex maintain and replace. So this maintain, re maintain and replace thing goes back to the beginning saying, you've got another problem. What's the problem? How do I solve this? Need to write the code. Need to compile it, run it. Did it run it expected? Debug it? No, it's just do... Th that's what you're doing. So this maintain step isn't... This done step, I'll put here, isn't the end. Usually you want to maintain your program if you want to make it last for years. Um, because there's still programs that were made in the 70s that are still running to this day. Um, because they work and they do their job as expected. That's what they wanted to do. So there you go. That is the process of making it. So now I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to put these in a nice little, I don't know, pink now. These, this step, this step, and this step are the steps I'm now going to talk about in detail. So the first thing is, how do we write our code? So I'm just going to make sure I'm on the same zoom level as before. Yeah. So how do I write this code? So I'm going to do another pink color. So writing code. So now you need a piece of software to write this code. And the way to do it is you use something called a text editor. Now a text editor is something that works with own plain text. Oops, text O, plain text O, no. plain text. Now, plain text is just literally, as it said, all it is is it's a file with the text in, nothing else. There's no formatting to it, there's no font information, no colour information, no margins, paper sizes, or anything like that. It's not a word processor. So a word processor, like Microsoft Word or LibreOffice or OpenOffice or whatever, or Notes, um, word processor so I do now in here handles with something called formatted text so this so plain text the only characteristic about it is it's just text in formatted text you've got text you've got fonts you've got colors you've got um, margins and uh, paper sizes and da 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 da. It, it goes on forever, the list does. So, when we're writing code, we do not want that. What we want is a text editor. Because all it does is handle text. All, it literally means it has characters, it has symbols, it has new lines, and that's it. Nothing else. We don't want a word processor. So, when we're, using, we're making code, do not use a word processor. Please don't. It will not work. So that's where our text editor comes in. So I'm going to show a few examples of text editors. Um, text editors. So examples of these are on Windows, there was one built in already, it's Notepad. You might have used it before, might not, I don't know. It's built into Windows. Um, so I just put W for Windows as a kind of, a, just write it down. Um, on Mac, you've got built in one called Text Edit. And I'll just put an M for Mac. Um, there's also um, Gedit. This is on like, Linux and stuff. There's Sublime. It's the one that I use. This is on Windows, uh, Mac, and Linux. 
I was thinking of doing to use Sublime for this series, but I want people to get dive into the language and don't worry about many things. So we're not going to use that. The one we're going to be using is Visual Studio. And I'll explain it. It only works on Windows, unfortunately. But the Windows Windows Studio, Visual Studio, I should say, Microsoft Visual Studio is something special. It's not just a text editor, though. It's actually something called an IDE or an Integrated Development Environment. I'll talk about that in a minute, but I want to say some more examples. So there's other examples like V, VI or Vim, and Emacs. So these are available on virtually everything. I'm not joking, so I'll say everything. And VMAC, v, Vim and Emacs, they are advanced text editors. They actually take time to learn. To actually learn it is probably takes the same amount of time as to learn a programming language. They are very skilled and they are, but they're not for beginners. So I would not recommend these at all for beginners. Okay? So okay, so now you've chosen your text editor to write your code in. Now what you need is a compiler. Yeah? So compiler. Now Again, this is the something about that translates your code that you wrote in your text editor and then translates it into something the operating system can understand. So examples of compilers are GCC. Now this is, and uh, there's Linux, uh, so there's Clang. I'm just going to write Clang. There's MSVC, and I'm going to write it like that because this is actually Microsoft, Visu so Microsoft Visual C++ and don't worry about it being C++ is it by default it programs you can compile C++ but we'll be compiling a C so this is the one we'll be using so I'm going to make a tick on the ones where you're going to be using uh, in a nice little like I don't know magenta thing pink and these are the ones we're going to be using on Windows um, all the compilers are also the Intel um, C compiler there's also just the C compiler which is on like Unix and stuff but there's 101 different ones this one is installed on Linux by default. So GCC is on Linux by default. The default one on Mac is Clang. However, it's not installed by default. You have to do install it, but usually install that using something like using Xcode and stuff. That's another thing I forgot to put on here, which is Xcode. Oops, Xcode, which is another one you'll see, which is on Mac. Um, so you can see what I'm just doing. I'm going to zoom out there so you can see it a bit more in full. So you've got your text editor and you've got your compilers. So next, the last step that I was talking about was I said a debugger. Now, a debugger. Now, this is an optional thing. But you don't need a debugger to write a program. All you need is a text editor and a compiler. But a debugger is useful sometimes if you want to understand what is going on with the actual code, what is actually happening to the memory, what is happening, what is actually... What, does the uh, disassembly look like all that lot? There's loads of things that debug can do. Can do, can help you. It's a tool. It's just a tool, like any of the other things. These are tools to help you solve your problem. So examples of debuggers are GDB. This is for like GCC. So for GCC, the compiler. There's LLDB. This is kind of for Clang. You can use um, GDB with Clang as well, but. If you've got code compiled from Clang, you can use GDB, but LLB, LLDB is okay as well. There's The other compiler is, again, Visual Studio. You can see why that's popping up. That's another debugger. And there's some other ones as well, but I won't go into them. They're the, they're the main ones, in a sense. And I'm going to put a tick next to Visual Studio. Now, if you look at the ticks that I've done, Visual Studio, uh, Visual C++, so Visual Studio, yeah, and Visual Studio, there's a text editor compiler and debugger. It seems to be that they're all the same tool. And the reason why is this is something called an IDE. So I'm just going to go back in. And we're going to talk about IDE. So an integrated integrated development environment. Or an IDE for short to its close friends. Yeah. Now, the thing about an integrated development environment is that it includes a text editor. It includes a compiler. It has a debugger. 
and many, many more features. So there's loads of steps in here. I mean, it could even add other things. It's even got um, profiling tools, um, sort of profiler in there and stuff. Don't worry about that. That's your code's running. It's all got no bugs, but you want to make it faster and stuff. Um, so you figure out where all the slow parts are. But there's loads of steps in an integrated development environment. And because you're beginners, I want you to just get crash in and then don't worry about all the other stuff. Because if I was teaching you with a text editor and a separate compiler, I would also have to teach you something called the command line. And I may do that in much later on videos if you want to learn how to do it. And that's the way I do it because I find that a much more easier process and more controllable process but for beginners I want you to just dive in and just write code and see what the output is straight away so what you'll be needing is an integrated development environment yeah good so stay tuned for the next episode so where I'll tell you how to install Visual Studio which is our IDE and how you can get the basic setup of stuff okay so stay tuned for that, and as always, thank you for watching, and have fun. Have fun while learning.